Number five on this list is the exorcism of Kennedy Ife. Kennedy Ife was a 26 year old man who reportedly became possessed by a demon. It started when he got an unexplained pain in his throat and then began to act very strange. He complained that there was a python inside of him and it forced him to bite his own father. He even threatened to cut off his own before his family strapped him to his bed and tied him down. His brother later said to the police that it's clear that this thing was in him what we believed was a demon because it was not natural. It was clearly trying to kill him. Kennedy did sadly die, however it wasn't at the hands of a demon, but actually by his own family. Kennedy had been tied to his bed for three days before his brother called for medical help. He was extremely dehydrated and developed breathing problems as he was lying there. When the paramedics got there, they pronounced him dead at the scene. The family had attempted to exorcise this demon out of Kennedy through prayer and extensive force. Kennedy's body had been battered through this exorcism as the family attempted to cure his soul. They were eventually all charged with manslaughter, however the jury found them not guilty in court and they were set free. Personally, I can't even imagine Imagine how brutal it would have been to be strapped to a bed for three days straight, getting beaten and slowly dehydrating. Truly a horrible way to die. Number four on this list is Fyodor Laxman. Fyodor Laxman was a Russian farmer in the early 1800s. For a long time, Fyodor had been in disputes with one of his close neighbors for farmland. They had developed a deep hatred for one another and would often sabotage each other's crops. Laxman eventually reached a breaking point after another blow from his neighbor and ended the dispute once and for all by murdering him and his family as they slept. A season passed and Laxman and his family prospered with the new land and their abundance of crops. However, However, during this time, something began happening in their home. The family felt unwanted there and signs of a demonic presence could be seen. After a while, the wife couldn't stand it anymore and she demanded that they have an exorcist come look at their home. They managed to find an exorcist several villages over to come and take a look at their house. He set up his supplies and was going to perform a ritual to cleanse the house of any demonic presence. When he began the ritual though, that demonic presence finally made itself abundantly clear. A shadow figure erupted from the wall and forced itself into Fyodor's body. It looked like a ghost had immediately entered his soul and taken all control of his actions. Fyodor's eyes went immediately bloodshot and he turned to his shocked wife and said the words, you take from me, I take from you. Then he reached out his hands and before the exorcist could stop him, strangled his own wife in front of his children, killing her where she stood. Right as her body fell to the floor, his did as well, devoid of life. A minute later, he started to slowly rouse himself and after seeing what he had done, broke into a deep sob. He knew that the ghost of his dead neighbor had haunted them and now Theodore was forced to live with the fact that he killed his own wife with his bare hands. Number three on this list is Rosetta Planker. Rosetta Planker was a young girl from the 1940s who became possessed by an evil demon. Her parents noticed that she started acting strange when her notebooks began filling up with demonic drawings and her nice innocent attitude vanished for dark depression out of nowhere. She started having issues at school which was completely out of character for her and the parents got to a point where they had to take her out. One day they found her in her room with her eyes rolled to the back of her head, stabbing one of her dolls repeatedly. It was at this point that they realized they had to get a professional in to perform an exorcism. They contacted their local pastor who set them up with a weathered exorcist. This exorcist had seen his fair share of demonic possessions in his day, but even he wasn't prepared for what happened during Rosetta's exorcism. They lay Rosetta on the bed and strapped her in as they typically would. Then the exorcist began performing his ceremony, but it didn't take long for things to get out of hand. Rosetta began to float off of the bed, flailing her limbs as best as she could under the restraints. Her head started spinning around and around in a completely inhuman way, looking as if it was breaking her neck over and over and over again. She was screaming at this point, but it wasn't her voice or any voice that anyone present was familiar with, nor was the voice making any sense, just demonic gibberish nobody could understand. When her ascension reached as high as the restraints would allow, her chest kept going further up and further up until finally her chest snapped open and blood exploded everywhere. A black ooze spouted onto her parents and the exorcist sending them back and disorienting them. The exorcist was forced to stop as he was blown back and covered in this black ooze. When he wiped it off his face and opened his eyes, he saw the ugly remains of Rosetta laying on the bed. The demon had clung onto her soul so tightly that it refused to leave without taking her with it. I can't even possibly imagine what it would have been like to be in that room or for the parents having to watch something like that. 
Number two on this list is Annalise Michelle. Annalise Michelle's exorcism story actually inspired the very popular horror film, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. What happened to Annalise is certainly not pretty. She was a young German woman who was born in the 50s. All of her life she struggled with serious mental health issues. Depression, hallucinations, and bad psychosis were all side effects of these problems which she actually had to be hospitalized for at some points. What was very strange was that her symptoms would often coincide with her being around religious acts or religious paraphernalia. This led her extremely religious parents, Aunt Annalise herself, to believe that she was possessed by a demon and needed it to be exorcised. She began having exorcisms performed to her when she was 22 years old and they went on for 10 months. In those 10 months, she had a ridiculous amount of exorcisms performed on her, with the count reaching above 70. That is more than an exorcism a week that was happening to her. After these brutal 10 months though, Annalise died. The cause of her death was a mixture of malnutrition, emaciation, and just pure starvation. The priests in charge of her exorcisms were taking extreme measures to get this demon out of her and abuse her body along the way. This case was brought to the court and it was proven that these priests were guilty of negligent homicide and had to serve jail time for her death. Similar to Kennedy, it was actually the exorcisms themselves and not the demon that took her life, which is pretty scary if you ask me. Number one on this list is the Panama exorcisms. Now I wish that I could describe exactly the ongoings of these exorcisms, but sadly we only have access to the aftermath of what transpired here. The Panama exorcisms happened in an indigenous jungle area of Panama and resulted in the murder of seven people. The bodies of these seven people included the likes of a pregnant woman, five of her children, and their neighbor. They were found in a mass grave and looked to be only the beginning of the murders if these murderous exorcisms hadn't been stopped when they were. That's because 15 other people were freed from captivity when the police raided the area. Apparently an indigenous run sect had been performing so called exorcisms and murdering people if they hadn't fully repented for their sins. The prosecutor of this case is quoted saying they were performing a ritual inside the structure. In that ritual, there were people being held against their will, being mistreated. All of these rites were aimed at killing them if they didn't repent their sins. The place where they were performing these exorcisms was a church where they found a naked woman, machetes, and a ritually sacrificed goat amongst other religious paraphernalia. What this group did was kidnap people and then bring them here to perform what they thought was God's will. The leader of the group said that they had received a message from God and that's why they were doing this. This brutal atrocity only happened a little over a year ago as well, so it's still very fresh. I don't know exactly what happened in these exorcisms, but we do know that it resulted in the murder of seven innocent people, which is just about as scary and sad as you can get. Number five on this list is the exorcism of Emma Schmidt. Emma Schmidt's exorcism was a widely publicized affair that happened in 1928. What's interesting about this case is that Emma Schmidt had actually been the subject of an exorcism from the same exorcist in 1912. Father Riesinger was the one who performed the exorcism in 1912 and when he heard about how she'd become possessed again, he rushed to help her. However, this time he didn't expect the demon to have as strong as a hold on her soul as it did. Now it's written that after Father Riesinger began to perform the exorcism, Emma dislodged herself from her bed and from the hands of her guards and her body carried through the air, landed high above the door of the room and clung to the wall with a tenacious grip. All present were struck with a trembling fear. The nuns who were present and assisting reportedly grabbed her and strapped her back down to the bed even though she was screaming and squirming in unnatural ways. It's said that this exorcism required 23 days to complete and during that time Emma would regularly be vomiting up bile and fighting as much as she could to stop it from happening. It's even said that Lucifer appeared during this exorcism and made his presence known by attacking the exorcist at one point. Emma also had super strength and was able to bend the iron bars on her bed even though she was extremely malnourished at that point. Father Riesinger was mentally drained and exhausted after the 23 days of performing that exorcism and claims that he had never seen anything like that in his time on earth. Number four on this list is the movie The Exorcist. Now The Exorcist is one of the most famous horror films of all time and is sometimes credited as being the scariest movie of the genre. Now the movie The Exorcist is actually based off of a real life exorcism that took place in the 1940s. This was an exorcism of a 14 year old boy documented under the pseudonym Roland Doe. 
Supernatural events took place during this exorcism which then inspired the creation of the film several decades later. Rather than look at the actual exorcisms here though, I actually want to look at the creation of the movie The Exorcist because there's actually a curse that surrounds it. Jack McGowan, the man who plays the film director in the movie, died before the film actually hit the big screens. He died due to influenza that he got in 1973. Vasiliki Malaros, who also acted in the movie, died before the movie was seen by anyone. Many people who were involved in filming of the movie lost their family members whilst the movie was in production. There was also a report of another one of the actors almost dying in a near fatal motorcycle crash. This was all coupled with the fact that in the early production of the movie, the entire set caught fire because a bird flew into the circuit box. There were several other crazy mishaps that went on during the filming of this movie, along with the actual premiere which was then hit with a lot of controversy. All of this has led people to believe that there is actually a curse tied to the movie and the entire production of it. Some believe that the demon from the initial exorcism in the 1940s came back to incite some chaos on the team recreating the story. Whatever the case was, it's certainly pretty crazy that one of the scariest movies of all time had one of the most controversial and scary filming processes of all time as well. Number 3 on this list is The Exorcism of Terence Cottrell. Terence Cottrell's exorcism is a sad story of a little boy who lived in Milwaukee in 2003. Terence in his mother's eyes had been possessed by a demon and she believed that it needed to be exorcised from him. This wasn't the case though. In fact, it seemed that Terence had actually been diagnosed with autism. However, the mother refused to believe this was the case and instead convinced herself that he was possessed. In 2003, she drove her boy to a strip mall in Milwaukee where there was the Faith Temple Church of the Apostolic Faith. A bunch of evangelical Christians gathered here and they had agreed to perform an exorcism on Terence and get rid of this so-called demon once and for all. Sadly, this isn't what happened at all and as I imagine many of you can expect, Terence was killed during the ritual. Once he arrived at the church, a sheet was thrown over top of him and it bound his arms and legs. The pastor, Reverend Ray Hemphill, who was performing the exorcism, lay the boy down with the sheet over top of him and then lay on top of him himself, whispering his ritual into the child's ear. This went on for over two hours until the reverend and the group realized that Terence had died. The official cause of death was listed as mechanical asphyxia due to external chest compression. The pastor had lied on Terence for too long and his weight basically crushed his chest. This along with the fact that he'd been wrapped in a sheet which would have made it difficult to breathe anyways caused the boy to suffocate. This case was obviously brought to the court of law and it was revealed that our so called exorcist was never properly trained on the subject at all. He went to jail for two and a half years and was barred from performing exorcisms unless he received extensive training on how to do them in the future. Number two on this list is an exorcism performed by Father Gabriel Amorth. Father Gabriel Amorth lived for almost a century and performed over 60,000 exorcisms in his long life. He's seen his fair share of demons and possessions, but one story in 1997 sticks out to him as being particularly bad. He co-wrote a book called The Devil is Afraid of Me where he details his extensive history with exorcisms, so if this is interesting to you, then I recommend checking that out. In that book, they describe this particular exorcism in detail stating that his curses and threats were aimed solely at the exorcist. Then he began spitting at him and preparing to attack him physically. The book goes on to say that screaming and howling, the demon burst forth and looked straight at him, drooling saliva from the young man's mouth. This was all being conducted on a young man who had apparently been the victim of a demonic possession for months and it was happening in Amar's small exorcism room in Rome. Amarth says that after the demon revealed itself, he screamed back, Whoever you are and all your companions who possess the servant of God, as I command you, tell me your name, the day and the hour of your damnation. To which the demon replied, I am Lucifer. The room then became icy cold and crystal started to appear on the windows. The young boy began to float in his chair and actual real life nails that Amorth still has to this day started to form in this person's mouth. Amorth was bellowing the word of God at this point and the demonic boy was shrieking at the top of his lungs. Finally the boy fell to the ground and looked completely spent. This was only the first exorcism performed on this boy and to fully exorcise the demon it took Amorth several more months of sessions like this. But up until the day he died he swore he never saw a demon that had that strong of a hold on somebody's soul. Number one on this list is the exorcism of Ryan Eastaw. Ryan lived back in the 1200s in Ireland. He worked as a fisherman and supported his newlywed wife. Ryan worked with another older fisherman named Hugh and Hugh had basically taught Ryan everything that he knew. In fact, when Ryan was younger, he was an orphan and being completely homeless would have to steal to survive. 
One day, Hugh caught Ryan stealing from him and rather than get the law involved, decided that he would take Ryan under his wing. That was over a decade ago and even though Hugh wasn't blood related to Ryan in any way, he may as well have been based on the relationship that the two had developed. One evening the pair were out on the water longer than they had intended and a storm whipped up. The men were trying to sail back to shore but the winds were harsh and unforgiving. With one swift gust, the boat was rocked hard and Hugh was thrown into the waves. Ryan ran to the side of the boat and saw as Hugh struggled to stay above water, but rather than help him by throwing him something or diving in himself, Ryan froze and just stood there. He stood there, planted, indecisive about what to do and slowly, Hugh drowned right before Ryan's eyes. Ryan managed to weather the storm and once it subsided got the boat back to shore, but he was never the same after that. His mood grew dark, his outlook on life was gloomy, and his temper would often rage. His wife, who was now pregnant with his child, feared the worst, believing that Ryan may have become possessed with a demon. Without Ryan's knowledge, she got in contact with an exorcist and had him wait at their home for when her husband would get back. He came home late the night that the exorcist was there and it was clear that he'd been drinking. He found his wife sitting there with the man and upon hearing her explanation of the scenario, grew furious. The exorcist saw this deep anger and took it to mean that the demon was coming out and possessing Ryan. As Ryan's anger grew, the exorcist pulled out his cross and started chanting some deep incantation to keep the demon at bay. He barely got through the first few lines though, when Ryan grabbed a nearby bottle and struck the exorcist across the head. The man hit the ground and blood pooled from that large indent that was now sliced across his forehead. He was dead and Ryan had murdered him. Immediately the fury was replaced with regret and Ryan dropped to his knees. Sadly, it was too late though. The deed was done and he was sentenced to death shortly afterwards. Whether Ryan was actually possessed by a demon or not, that's unknown. I personally think the only demons that he was ever possessed with are the demons that he imposed onto himself for never acting when his father figure, Hugh, drowned in front of his eyes. Number 5 on this list is the exorcism of Dan Abudani. Dan was a young adult living in Malaysia who ran a local business that he inherited from his father. He sold textiles and did okay for himself, certainly not getting rich but also not being dirt poor either. For reasons unbeknownst to him, Dan started to notice some strange ongoings at his store. He had been running it for roughly a year and all of a sudden strange things started to happen. The lights which were brand new would flicker uncontrollably and then just as quickly stop as if nothing happened. The register would sometimes just open without warning as if some ghost thief was trying to rob Dan. A harsh wind would blow his textiles when there was no window or door open for wind to blow through. Dan was never somebody to believe in the paranormal or anything like that, but his late father was and he remembered him telling him a legend of a family who was killed on this area of land prior to them erecting their textile company. After some months of these ongoings, he finally decided to get in contact with somebody who knew something about the supernatural natural and they recommended getting an exorcism done. Dan was reluctant at first but finally caved and had an exorcist brought in to see if they could do anything. After examining the space, the exorcist insisted that not only a ritual be performed on the storefront but also one be performed on Dan to make sure that no demon was clinging on to anything in the space. If Dan was going to go down this route then he had better do what they tell him so he agreed. He was strapped down to a chair in the back of the store and the exorcist began performing their ritual. At first nothing happened but then the wind started to pick up. Up, the lights started to flicker and the register began operating as if it had a mind of its own. A deep shadow filled the room and even though the lights were on, it felt like darkness was overpowering them. The exorcist was chanting his ritual as loudly as he could at this point, trying with all of his ability to exercise whatever was occupying the space. Just as it felt like he might be making progress, a deep voice boomed throughout the space and said, leave my home. Just as that finished, a pair of scissors that was lying on one of Dan's workbenches flew from where it was and pierced the exorcist directly in his neck. He fell to the ground and life slowly left his body with Dan strapped to the chair unable to help him. Dan was found in his store two days later by a neighbor extremely dehydrated and close to death. He told the police what I told you but they didn't believe him and he went to jail for murder. A really sad story of a young guy who just happened to own the wrong store at the wrong time. Number 4 on this list is the most famous case from the notable exorcist Father Vincenzo Terraborelli. Father Vincenzo Terraborelli is one of the most known exorcists in the world. He's stationed in Rome and well into his 80s at this point. The Catholic Church has been attempting to find a successor for his role, but no priest wants to take on the deep mental strain that it will cause them. Now it's said that Father Vincenzo Terraborelli will see up to 30 people in one day. He often urges someone who intends to become an exorcist to regularly see a psychologist as the 
job is incredibly draining. The exorcism that we're going to look at from him today is one case that has actually spanned over 13 years. The woman was deeply possessed and it took over a decade for Father Vincenzo to eventually oust the demon. He spoke about the ongoings of these exorcisms in an interview back in 2016 and he will do a far better job explaining the situation than me. So I quote, another man who was a Satanist wanted her. She refused. So this man told her, you'll pay for this. He cast so called spells to attract her to him twice a week. Then they came to me in this room. I started to pray and she went into a trance. She would blurt out insults, blasphemies. I quickly understood she was possessed. As the rite continued, she started feeling worse and worse. So when I told the devil, in the name of Jesus, I order you to go away, she started to vomit little metal pins five at a time. Aside from pins, she would also vomit hair braids, little stones, pieces of wood. It sounds like something from another world, right? Instead, it's something from this world." End quote. That last sentence really gets to me. It sounds like something from another world, but instead it's something from this world. And that's exactly what I thought when I first heard this story. How on earth is it possibly real for someone to vomit up little stones or pieces of wood? Frankly, I would be petrified if I saw someone doing that and I completely understand why Father Vincenzo recommends seeing a psychologist before you take on this role. Number 3 on this list is the exorcism of Beatrice Clement. Beatrice Clement was a young woman who was said to have lived in the 9th century. She was a mother of two children and her husband was a butcher. At about the time she turned 30 years old, she started to experience episodes. These were episodes of psychosis that would be accompanied by deep hallucinations. It became increasingly apparent that her mental state was draining and the reality that she thought she lived in was far different than the truth. As with many other things back then, these episodes were chalked up to the work of the devil. Her husband, her children, her neighbors, everybody believed that a demon was in charge of her soul at this point. This obviously meant that an exorcism was in order. An exorcist was brought into Beatrice's home and was intended to eradicate the demon from her soul. The methods of these exorcisms were brutal though. It often involved abusing Beatrice, withholding food and water, and other means of torture that were ultimately ineffective at getting rid of the demon. This went on for several weeks until it became increasingly clear that it wasn't working how they intended. One evening, Beatrice snuck out of her home and decided to take her own life. She couldn't manage to make it through one more exorcism, but truly believed in her soul that she was a danger to society in her present state. The sad thing about this whole story is that she most likely wasn't possessed by a demon at all. Some form of mental illness manifested itself in her and sadly led to her death months later. Number 2 on this list is the exorcisms of Saint Guthlec. He's often referred to as Saint Anthony the Great in Orthodox Christianity and is one of the greatest hermit saints of the early English church. He was born in 673 and was very attractive to demons. I found a passage that would actually describe these demons and I'm going to read that out now. They were ferocious in appearance, terrible in shape with great heads, long necks, thin faces, yellow complexions, filthy beards, shaggy ears, wild foreheads, fierce eyes, foul mouths, horses teeth, throats vomiting flames, twisted jaws, thick lips, strident voices, singed hair, fat cheeks, pigeon's breast, scabby thighs, naughty knees, crooked legs, swollen ankles, splay feet, spreading mouths, raucous cries. For they grew so terrible to hear with their mighty shriekings that they filled almost the whole intervening space between earth and heaven with their discordant bellowings. That's the passage and even though that's some pretty bad stuff and they would actually go on to beat him with iron bars, he claimed that he wasn't afraid of these demons. That being said though, he did realize that they had to go. Guthic was actually approached by the holy apostle Bartholomew and given a whip. This whip was what he used to eradicate the demons from himself and ultimately become one of the most famous exorcists. A famous tale from Saint Guthlec was an exorcism that he performed on a man named Ekka. Ekka was deeply possessed by a demon and required the help of Guthlec. Daniel Esperaza, an expert on the subject, writes, Guthlec took off his belt, wrapped it around Ekka's waist and squeezed it until the demon was breathed out. That means guys that during this exorcism, Ekka literally threw up a demon. I personally cannot imagine how horrible that would have been to get squeezed so hard that you throw up a demon. I suppose it's actions like that which have made Saint Guthlick's name live forever. Number 1 on this list is the exorcism of Fenton Lambert. Fenton Lambert was a 64 year old man when he had his exorcism done to him. He lived in the 1700s and was a common worker. He had a wife and they had a son. 
However, their son died at a young age from disease. Fenton was a religious man and regularly went to church and prayed. He believed in God and knew in his heart that he was looking out for their best interests. His wife wasn't nearly as devout though. After the death of their son, she went into a deep depression and couldn't understand how God could possibly let their child die like that. Fenton tried to convince her that she needed to remain faithful, but knew that she never fully bought into that way of life again. One thing he wasn't aware of though, was how far she'd went in the other direction. One evening he woke up to find his wife staring over top of him. He was laying on the bed and he was tied down so that he couldn't move. He squirmed and tried to protest, but his wife wasn't having any of it. He could see that by the look in her eyes, she was clearly not connected to reality anymore. She started to chant some demonic ritual of some kind, words that Fenton had never heard come from her mouth before. Then his wife procured a knife and brought it to Fenton's chest. She continued her chant and then began cutting into him, not deep enough to kill, but enough to cause a serious laceration. Fenton was squirming as much as he could and through his struggling got his left hand free. He hit his wife to the ground and quickly freed his other hand before she could get back to him. Recovered from the hit, she jumped on him and tried to get him back into his restraints. The pair tussled until Fenton once again threw her to the ground where she stumbled and landed on her knife. She proceeded to slowly bleed out in front of her husband's eyes. Days later, he found her journal in the home and saw that she'd been planning to perform an exorcism on him for months. In this instance though, the one performing the exorcism was very clearly the one possessed by something sinister. 